Nice to see everybody tonight. Um, we are here for Rethinking Ways in Johnkins County, fostering a local circular economy. Uh, my name is Leo Riley. Um, I am the interim director for Tompkins County's Department of Recycling and Materials Management. Um, I've worked in the recycling industry for 40 plus years. Um, the last 17 has been with Tompkins County. And to prove that, I have a computer here and I have a piece of paper here. So, <laughs> um, I'm going to just start with just a, a real quick safety brief. Um, we've got exits to the back, we've got a couple exits to the side, and then we can exit to the left in case of emergency. Uh, Jeremy Betterly has offered to uh, call 911 in the case of any kind of emergency. Um, I'd like to introduce some of the members of our team tonight. Um, Kate Collins is our uh, communications coordinator. Uh, Kate has come to us from a number of years in local journalism. Uh, Jeremy Betterly, right here, he's a waste, or, I'm sorry, recycling waste reduction coordinator. Uh, Jeremy's been with us for seven years. He over oversees our food scraps recycling programs. Next we have Nate Bates. Uh, Nate has been with us for a little over 11 years, I believe, and he oversees our household hazardous waste program along with uh, monitoring and management of our closed landfills. Lastly, uh, Kat McCarthy. Uh, she is also a waste reduction and recycling coordinator, and Kat oversees our waste reduction reuse programs. Uh, Kat was with us uh, back in 2006 for 11 years. Uh, found her way back just recently this past September. <clears throat> Kat has been uh, very invaluable uh, as the lead writer of the uh, uh, Solid Waste Management Plan, Rethinking Waste in Tompkins County, Fostering the Local Circular County. I had to say that a couple times for Kat. <laughs> uh, Kat will be presenting the, the highlights of the plan tonight. The plan was developed thanks to the hard work of many of the department staff. Um, I do want to give a shout out to our recently retired uh, director, Barb Ekstrom. Um, she was very instrumental in uh, the development of this plan. We are also working with uh, Barton LeJudas um, supporting us with the plan. Um, and they're helping us with the development and ensuring the um, meets the, the state's requirements. Tonight's, uh, tonight's meeting is being recorded. Uh, the agenda for the evening will include presentation from Kat McCarthy, opportunity for public feedback. We will conclude the meeting promptly at 7.15. Uh, as you came in, uh, we hoped you signed in and also um, checked that you would be a speaker, and then that's how we'll call you up. Just a reminder, um, if you have multiple people from one group, please consider having one person representing your group. <clears throat> Due to the size of the crowd today, I think we have upwards of 30 people to speak. Each speaker will have up to three minutes to share their feedback. Please be respectful so others will have the opportunity to speak. In the interest of time, our staff does not intend to respond to feedback this evening. Uh, please remember that if you would like to submit a comment, we are requesting that they be submitted in writing. I do want to make one statement uh, regarding an error. There was an error in Chapter 2 that stated that biosolids from Kiga Heights was both land applied and disposed of in a landfill. The data received from the village since 2017 
reflects that material is not being land applied. There is no explicit commitment in the plan to increase land application of this material. The plan directly states that research needs to be conducted to better understand potential opportunities for diversion. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Captain Carter. Thank you, Leah, and good evening, everybody. I am so excited to be here. So much work has been put into this plan, and we are really looking forward to sharing it with the community and hearing feedback this evening. So as a planning unit in New York State, Tompkins County is responsible for developing and implementing a local solid waste management plan. This plan evaluates current materials management practices, reviews options and alternatives for future management, and sets forth implementation steps for a 10-year planning period covering 2023 through 2032, along with projections of reduction in waste disposal for that time frame. To frame where we are today, it's helpful to understand some of the background about decisions that were made as their materials management systems were being formed in this county. In the mid-1980s, the department was faced with the closure of two local landfills. At the same time, the state had passed the Solid Waste Management Act and set forth its hierarchy for materials management, as well as development of local solid waste management plans to outline how materials would be handled for the coming 20 years. This set forth a planning process that ultimately led to the decision not to site another local landfill and to transfer trash to an out-of-county landfill. This marked a decision to invest in recycling and materials diversion strategies and has had long-term impacts on our system. The county built the Recycling and Solid Waste Center, offered curbside residential recycling collection, created a pay-as-you-throw trash tag law, established mandatory recycling, and shifted the focus to the 4R programs. And ultimately, this laid the groundwork for an ongoing focus on waste reduction and materials management as opposed to disposal since we do not have to feed a local landfill. There have been a number of developments since the early stages. The Recycling and Solid Waste Center is operated through a public-private partnership, and with each new contract for operations, as well as material bans at the state level, we've increased the types of recyclables that can be accepted, shifted from dual stream to single stream recycling, and invested in more efforts to recycle food scraps, among other things. And as we approach the development of this plan, there are many strong programs in place and this lays the groundwork for even more opportunity to reduce, reuse, recycle, and rethink our waste. So what's in this plan? The New York State Department of Environmental Conservation has laid out requirements that each local draft plan encompass the following items, which are laid out in chapters of our draft. I'll provide some highlights of each section through this presentation, and ultimately this plan is designed to outline our community's background, including current materials generation rates, current programming and administrative and financial structure, as well as the anticipated, or as well as plans for implementation, a timeline, and the anticipated impacts on the waste stream over a 10-year planning period. As acknowledged in the organization's diversity statement, Tompkins County Government centers diversity, equity, and inclusion. We are committed to the empowerment of employees and residents to dismantle systemic barriers that inhibit inclusive governance and the provision of government services to all. This plan has been developed with the recognition that inequity in access to resources and opportunities impact the waste stream as well. DEI is important across the plan, and it is introduced upfront with the intention that these concepts will be built into program design and implementation in order to provide accessible and inclusive opportunities that support the needs of the community. Chapter 1 provides background on the planning unit, which is Tompkins County. So it includes size, location, population, membership, and more. It highlights seasonal variations in materials generation, such as fluctuations with student movement out, tourism, and agricultural operations. Chapter 1 also outlines some of the generators in the community and their impacts, such as residents, businesses, and, and institutions. 
We live and work in a community where individuals express strong interest in sustainability and high expectations for county-provided materials management services. There are public and private facilities designed to support our materials management system. And due to these items, as well as various characteristics between areas, geography, and groups, it is clear that one single strategy for materials management will not work here. We need a framework that prevents a presents a variety of solutions to meet all of our community's needs. Chapter two presents an, an overview of the quantities and types of materials generated locally based on the baseline year of 2021. Data from these chapters comes from self-reporting, data from the county facilities, and estimates from the New York State DEC MSW composition projections. There are five major components of the waste stream as outlined on this slide. And for the purpose of rethinking waste in Tompkins County, MSW consists of waste generated in homes, businesses, institutions, and the commercial portion of the waste discarded by industries. Based on annual reports submitted to the DEC for 2021, Tompkins County residents and businesses generated approximately 125,054 tons of waste, including potentially recyclable materials. The figure on this slide shows the overall method of management for this waste, with approximately 42% diverted and 58% landfilled. I do want to note that in developing this presentation, we identified a few minor data entry errors in this chapter. This includes the aforementioned quantity of overall materials generated, as well as the destination and quantity of biosolids generated from Huga Heights. As Leo noted, as of 2017, the village has reported that their biosolids are not land applied. This, these data errors will be updated in the draft that is submitted to the DEC. Chapter 3 reviews our existing programs. This includes existing solid waste management facilities, transfer stations, and other facilities. For our programs encompassing waste reduction, reuse, organics management, recycling, and rethinking waste, <laughs> materials management by sector, uh, residue, which includes the collection, weight-based pricing incentives, household hazardous waste, pharmaceuticals, and sharps, communications and education, local law and law enforcement, hauler licensing, and data collection efforts and gaps. The administrative and financial structure of the department is designed to enable the development, maintenance, and sustainability of an integrated solid waste management system that facilitates waste reduction, reuse, recycling, composting, and other diversion activities to the greatest extent possible. Revenue streams for the department include the annual fee, disposal fees, recycling revenue, grant revenue, and other miscellaneous income. When paired with our local laws, we have a system in which there's an incentive to reduce waste, fund for our programs, and support initiatives to responsibly manage the materials generated within this county. It's important to highlight these laws and how they support our current structure. So the recycling law ensures that basic mandatory recyclables are identified. The pay as you throw trash tags and disposal fees ensure paying for the cost of disposal. Through the system, haulers charge for the cost of disposal based on the disposal rate at our facility on a trash tag for containerized sat out at the curb. So every bag of trash at the curb should have a tag on it, paying for the cost of disposal of the materials within. Pay as you throw and mandatory recycling go together to incentivize diversion, creating a financial incentive to recycle. Hauler licensing supports data collection and a mechanism for communicating with current system stakeholders. And lastly, disposal, which is informally known as illegal dumping, ensures that materials are ha handled properly in an environmentally sound manner. With the baseline of background and current information about the planning unit, we then look ahead in Chapter 5 to what is planned for the next 10 years. Through this plan, we are really leaning into for our programming to increase diversion. There's tremendous opportunity to foster a local circular economy where materials are used for their highest and best value for as long as possible. And products at their end of life can become feedstocks or inputs for new systems. This takes a holistic approach to materials management, looking for opportunities to reduce and reuse prior to recycling, 
and rethink waste to redesign systems that create a positive feedback loop for minimizing waste. I want to point out that the reference to trash as residue is intentional in this document. The department's overall plan emphasizes strategies for diverting material from the landfill with trash as an option of last resort. And while I won't opt outline all the components of this chapter in today's presentation, it's important to review some of the highlights of our 4 r strategies. Waste pre prevention re represents the largest opportunity to reduce waste by not creating it in the first place. And this requires a departure from a single-use disposable ethos that is pervasive in this country. Community engagement and education, along with modifications to infrastructure and systems, will all support such a shift. This section covers components like education and engagement to support these shifts, movement toward a sharing economy where the benefit from the utility of an item without needing to own it, toxic reduction measures, and more. Reuse can be both solutions-based and educational, such as teaching maintenance and repair skills. Representing economic and workforce development opportunities, reuse presents significant growth potential in our community. This section encompasses a broad variety of strategies, such as increasing repair, expanding dishware and packaging reuse, deconstruction, and materials exchanges, just to name a few. Recycling programs are designed with convenience and accessibility in mind, offering options for both residential and commercial sectors. With long-standing recycling programs already established in Tompkins County, many of these highlighted strategies in the draft plan are designed to build on existing infrastructure and programs. To handle organics, it's important to promote holistic management strategies that encompass prevention, donation, and composting. This plan outlines strategies to prevent food waste before it's created, increase donation efforts, and expand access to participation in composting of food scraps recycling, such as community composting, where appropriate. The fourth R in Tompkins County is Rethink, which encourages individuals to shift their mindset, current habits, and other practices that lead to waste generation. It challenges people to reconsider how they think about goods and the products in their lives. And this can include green purchasing, where they can help close the loop and promote the purchase of goods that support waste reduction, reuse, and recycling. It also includes reviewing and understanding manufacturing and pro processing practices to refocus on waste avoidance. Chapter 6 then focuses on plan implementation across 10 implementation items. The first few include building out programming to support waste reduction, expanding activity and infrastructure to include increased reuse countywide, increasing participation in recycling programs, as well as expanding opportunities for all community members. Organics recovery, ranging from prevention to donation to uh, recycling. Rethinking, evaluating systems and implementing new structures that support sustainable materials management, be it through EPR, green purchasing, or other efforts. Managing residue or trash by continuing the pay-as-you-throw program and household hazardous waste collection and overseeing closed landfills. Local laws and enforcement, which help support overall system goals. And finally, communications, how we plan to reach out and engage with people, data collection and evaluation, with an aim towards improving quality to better understand how material is being managed. And lastly, reviewing available technologies or understanding any new opportunities for diversion and responsible materials management as they arise. These items are then applied to an implementation schedule to develop a 10-year timeline that projects milestones for the identified activities. Chapter 7, lastly, looks at how the plan strategies will impact the waste stream over the 10-year planning period and includes MSW as well as construction and demolition materials. Over the past 10 plus years, we have seen shifts in consumerism with an emphasis on single-use throwaway culture focused around convenience. Products are quickly replaced with newer models, and materials are becoming more challenging with items containing harmful chemicals such as mercury, freon, and heavy metals. And with that being noted, we have an optimistic outlook for the future of this planning period. Our projections are based on implementation of programs within the plan, and an assumption of a downward trend in population that mirrors waste, re waste generation. So as you can see on this slide, it demonstrates the shift in per capita municipal solid waste generation in pounds per person per day. 
For reference, the state solid waste management plan projects a statewide generation rate in 2023 of 3.91 pounds per person per day, going down to, in 2032, 2.42 pounds per person per day. So we are well on our way of supporting the state's goals of an 85% total waste stream recycling rate by 2050. As noted, the public comment period for this draft is now currently underway, and we written comments are being accepted until August 7th. Once we've received public comments, we will develop a responsiveness summary and make any needed adjustments to the plan. Following this, we will submit a draft to the DEC for review, and this can take up to 120 days. Once we receive state feedback, any comments will be incorporated into the plan as needed, and it will follow county process for review and adoption. We will be hearing public feedback in a few moments, but I wanted to iterate, reiterate that if you would like to submit comments for the record, please submit these in writing, either to the email address listed here or to our office, attention Leo Riley, interim director. Comments will be accepted through August 7th. So at this point, I'd like to thank you all for your time and invite Kate Collins up for, to the podium to help facilitate our public feedback session. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much, Kat. So again, I'm Kate Collins. I'm the communications coordinator, and this is going to be the public feedback um, portion of our presentation. So again, as a reminder, um, out of respect for everyone who wants to speak, we ask that each group des designate one person to speak, and speakers will have up to three minutes to speak. And again, in the interest of time, our staff, our staff does not intend to respond to comments today. Who's next to each time you do that so that people are ready? Yes, Michael, and then Richard from Ithaca. You should pick up a little bit. Get a little bit. The first yeah. speaker is Michael from the town of Thurston. And right. the next is Richard from the city of Ithaca. You go ahead to the microphone. Okay. Thank you. My name is Michael Valino. I'm the town supervisor of Thurston, uh, the town where the biosolids, also known as sewer sludge, has been sent to from Cayuga Heights, uh, Trumansburg, and Dryden for the past several uh, decades. Um, it's good to hear that as of 2017, Cayuga Heights has not sent any sewer sludge to um, Thurston. However, the current land spreading permit that Dixon's operate under, the land spreading permit from 2019 that is in effect until 2024, uh, allows uh, sewer sludge to be accepted from Cayuga Heights, Trumansburg, and um, Dryden. So I, um, on page 32, I would like a language to be amended, the land spreading 
from Cuba Heights, removed, landfilled. Also, it says for the village of Trumansburg, it's unknown, landfill that as well. Uh, this is the only good use, in my opinion. Um, sewage sludge shouldn't be landfilled, it should not be composted, it should not be uh, land applied because of the contamination of PFAS as well as other heavy metal chemicals. Um, the Sierra Club, um, the Finger Lake Sierra Club, uh, with the help of, of Bill Mattingly and Elizabeth Dondrowitz, uh, did water testing on the adjacent farms, um, uh, farms adjacent to the Dixon operation. They found uh, PFAS contamination in 200 feet deep wells um, above the new EPA and DEC standards. Um, I also like, you know, to note that um, land that has had biosolids spread on it can cannot be registered for uh, or for organic farming. So we have farms in Thurston adjacent to the Dixon operation um, that no longer can be, be registered as farming. Farm Credit East also does not loan to farmers that spread biosolids. And I also want to know that Dixon Farms has recently sold to Casella Organics. Um, a main base company. Uh, they purchased the 2800 Dixon operation that spans Thurston, Cameron, as well as Bath County, seat of Stuart County. Um, and their plan is to start bringing in uh, sewer sludge from uh, uh, Bay Park, Nassau County. So we're pushing back on this as a town. Um, we, we, we hope, I and mean, we are a, a small uh, rural community, uh, we don't have a lot of funds, but we are pushing back. So anyway, what Cassell wants to do in Thurston, in Steuben County now, is banned in the state of Maine. And um, anyway, I uh, just like to consider that, and I thank you for giving me the ability to speak this evening. Thank you. Next up, we have Richard. After Richard, we will have Beat. Uh, I'm Richard Entlick. I am not here representing an organization or a uh, municipality or anything. I'm just a long-term resident of uh, the city of Ithaca with a long-term interest in solid waste uh, issues. Um, I wanted to thank the staff of TCRMM for the thoroughness, comprehensiveness, and thoughtfulness of the draft plan. Uh, I've only just finished reading the part that comes before the appendices, and <clears throat> there's a lot in there. Um, I will be submitting written comments on, on a lot of issues, but sort of as a view from 10,000 feet reaction, uh, the, the thing that I notice is that uh, all of the landfills currently being used by the county are slated to retire their operations within the 10 years uh, that this plan covers. And yet the total amount of landfill, landfill production is only anticipated to be halved down to like 27,000 tons. Um, and it, it just strikes me that there is less urgency in this report than I think is, is really needed to tackle this problem. And also that uh, the county alone, uh, no matter how good our planning is, is only going to be able to accomplish so much. Many of the, the most impactful changes that could be made will have to come from the state legislature um, or um, from producers and manufacturers of goods who are probably the, the least likely to be cooperating on this unless their, their hand is forced. Um, so I, I would just like to say we have, a, we have big problems and I, I think we need to be thinking bigger in terms of solutions. Thanks. Thank you. Next up, we have Veet, and after Veet is Molly. You gotta speak closer to the microphone. Next up is Veet, and after Veet is Molly. So Veet. You have a 
next to me? D-E-H-A. Um, we did have someone have to leave early to get to the bus. Okay. So, then Molly, Molly Kelly, and after Molly is Diane Cohen. Hello. I wanted to say that my town has the best raccoons in Tompkins County. <laughs> I am saying that because several of our neighbors put their garbage out without being in a can. These raccoons are smart and they have a really nice lunch or dinner and they bring all of their friends. Now I did as much research as I could and I could not find that it was mandated that you have to put your garbage in a can. I could be wrong, I did try to look. If that's the case, I think it would be lovely to mandate garbage being put in a can, period. I also think that it would be lovely for people to, for, for there to be a mandate that the garbage cans have the attached lids. Now how many here, I need to, oh, the time is so fast. The other thing I wanted to mention is even the newscasters on the evening news suggest that we not put our recyclables out when there's a high wind because the wind blows the recyclables out all over everywhere and we're a very conscientious recycling community. There are communities and municipalities close to us that have small toters that's mandated to put your recyclables in. I was born in Ireland, I just got back from there. No, I do not drink whiskey. And just so you know, because that's what everybody asks when they say I'm Irish. Um, and there's not one scrap of paper in that country. I mean, it's so clean. We could do that here. This is Tompkins County. It's a beautiful area. Thank you. Thank you. Diane is next, and then after Diane, we have Susan Holland. Hi. Um, thanks, everyone. I'm Diane Cohen. I'm the uh, CEO of Finger Lakes Reuse. Uh, nice to see a bunch of friends here today. Uh, really um, appreciate the work of the staff, and particularly Kat, and, um, in putting together this plan, particularly around reuse initiatives. EPR, which is Extended Producer Responsibilities, and the Circular Economy. It's really fantastic to see these concepts in a, a solid waste management plan. Uh, while we as the public look to the staff of the Department of Recycling <coughs> and Materials Management to put this plan together and guide us in order to achieve the program strategies in this plan, all stakeholders, generators of waste, consumers, and government through incentives and legislation need to play a role. A massive transformation is necessary and I believe achievable. This includes an extensively enhanced public-private partnership with waste haulers, handlers, educational institutions, workforce development efforts such as career pathways, businesses and social enterprises to work together to more effectively collect, sort, and send valuable materials into circular markets and out of waste streams. It's time to move away. Actually, Rich said um, producers are manufacturers of goods goods are going into the waste. We need to get those goods back out. Um, it's, time, it's time to make, move away from business as usual and explore new opportunities. Our good friend Barb Ekstrom had the vision to plan for and, and implement a reuse center in Tompkins County as a key waste reduction strategy. As the fortunate person who remains honored to lead this effort, I recognize the uniqueness of my experience and perspective in this role. I still recall the importance to Barb for a public-private partnership in the early planning phase and have realized the wisdom in her words. Private industry can act quickly. There's an enormous opportunity to convert the liability of waste at great cost on many levels into the asset of feedstocks for businesses and enterprises, jobs and communities. But this requires some public support to get this effort to scale in a truly meaningful way. I believe we need to think beyond traditional waste or materials management models and look to business, businesses and enterprises to help address the daunting task ahead, minimizing and eventually completely eliminating unnecessary waste. 
Some of that work must be structured as an end of pipe solution, and other work will take a longer timeline when the producers of these materials more actively participate in the solutions. But in the meantime, the building up of the already naturally growing reuse economy is low hanging fruit. Many of the proposed initiatives in the plan are giving the timeline of over the next decade or during the next planning period. And meanwhile, high value marketable materials continue to stream into countless dumpsters and dump trucks powered by diesel headed to final destinations where their value will be forever lost. Finger Lakes Reuse is, uh oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I request one more minute? Can I cede my three minutes to her? We're, we're trying to stick to three minutes. All right. Um, all right. Well, I will be submitting written comments, and thank you, everybody. Good to see you. <laughs> I just have like 30 seconds to say. Can I see two of my minutes so she can finish hers? That's right. We've got upwards of 30 people okay. speaking, so we're going to stick to three minutes. Max. <laughs> um, I'm Miranda, just a resident of Fall Creek here in Ithaca. Um, I wanted to echo the thanks to, and this is really inspiring that we're. Um, uh, doing as much as we already are and that we have as much ambition as we have um, and also to um, echo what uh, Michael said I, I came in in large part to say that I'm very much against um, land application of sludge um, and would very much want to see a ban in New York State like in Maine um, and uh, and I'm very excited to hear more from Diane about how the public can, how I as a citizen can help with your um, inspiring vision of going beyond, even beyond this plan. Thank you. Thank you, Miranda. Linda from Cranger Heights. this too, I'm pretty sure. Uh, my name is Linda Woodard. I am the mayor of Cuba Heights. Um, I came here primarily to um, clarify some um, misconceptions. Um, Leo, I thank you for um, getting with Brent and figuring out what was going on. Um, we did, uh, in 2016, uh, give our, our sludge so that it was put on land. It, that no longer happens. Um, since the beginning of 2022, um, we have been taking it to Steuben County uh, to the landfill. Um, the last six months, we have been actually taking our, our um, it's more than sludge, it's, it's much more um, liquidy to the Ithaca area uh, wastewater treatment plant because our plant is undergoing multi-million dollar renovations. Uh, and one of them is uh, redoing the uh, digesters. Um, besides that, um, I received a uh, notice of what uh, the town supervisor of Thurston had written. Uh, this is infuriating. I see this as a draft proposal. Toxic sewer sludge is being taken from affluent Cuba Heights to be land applied in rural poverty stricken Thurston. Um, and we know the second part of that is not true. Uh, but I'd also like to talk about the first part. Uh, yeah, the village of Cuba Heights is a wealthy community. Uh, but the wastewater treatment plant that we own serves not just the village of Cuba Heights, but also the village and town of Lansing. Uh, and parts of the town of Ithaca and Dryden. Um, so, it, so it's erroneous to think of this as um, just people that are extremely rich. Um, in fact, the, the facility itself is in the town of Ithaca. Um, and I actually feel very similar to you in the sense that I think that putting sludge on land is not a good idea. Um, we don't have good solutions. None of them are good. Uh, and as one of the other speakers said, 
we are going to be closing the, the landfills about where people are going at this point. So we really do need to rethink, and I do think that the best way we can handle the situation is to reduce the amount um, going forward. So I really applaud the kinds of things that you're trying to do. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Timothy, and after Timothy, we have Yayoi. Hi folks, my name is Tim Hargrave. Uh, my wife and I own a farm in the town of Cameron, located in Stubent County. Can you use the mic, please? The mic. What's that? Can you use the mic, please? Sorry, Danger. I gotta halt my time a little bit there. So, I'll start out with a little background information on how PFAS chemicals, also known as forever chemicals, are linked to land spreading of sludge. Uh, exposure to these forever chemicals have been linked to certain types of cancer, birth-related complications, birth defects, thyroid disease, liver damage, and many other health problems. The New York State Department of Health Commissioner described, or he sent a letter to, to the DEC describing the ways that PFAS forever chemicals get into the environment, specifically landfill leachate and land spreading of sewage sludge on farms. In fact, this same pathway from land spreading sludge is very apparent in the state of Maine. For years, the state of Maine, just like New York, has promoted sewage sludge as a beneficial soil amendment. However, they are now discovering that this sludge contains high levels of PFAS and forever chemicals. And as a result, these farms that use this sludge have been shut down and they can no longer sell or market their meat, their milk, or other farm produce. Maine has even issued a do not eat advisory for deer and turkey in some areas. Because of this PFAS contamination, Maine has taken the bold step of banning the spreading of sewage sludge on farmlands. Other states are considering similar restrictions. Dr. Murray McBride, Professor Emeritus, Cornell University, whose forte is crop and soil science, recently gave his current opinion on a policy of land spreading of sewage sludge on farmland. Yeah. Professor McBride said this, the fairly recent discoveries in Maine and Michigan that PFAS forever chemicals are being found on farms, in well water, and in vegetable crops and dairy products where sludge has been applied sometimes decades earlier is proof that the present rules for biosolids application on land do not protect farmland, farmers, or the general public. Instead, farmland application provides a direct pathway for contamination of food crops, meat, dairy products with persistent organic toxins including hundreds of PFAS chemicals. He goes on to say that the farmland application of sludge is the most ill-advised and potentially dangerous option for sludge disposal. On page 67, section 515 of the Tompkins County Waste Plan, it says Tompkins County Department of Recycling Materials Management will seek and promote emerging toxics. As Professor McBride demonstrated, these rubber chemicals are in fact emerging toxins. In fact, New York State has already designated PFOA and PFOS, part of the PFAS uh, forever chemical family, they designated these as hazardous substances. In closing, I got a lot more I'd like to say, but in closing, I urge the county to be bold and follow Maine's footsteps and enact a countywide ban on all sludge land spreading. I urge you to return Professor McBride for facts and information. I'll leave you this simple quote. In 2022, Melanie Loisum of Maine's DEC Commissioner said this, it's like a nightmare you can't wake up from. People's livelihoods and homes have been destroyed and the scale of the tragedy Thank keeps you. growing with every sample that we take. Thank you.
for hosting this public meeting. Transparency and open dialogue are crucial for addressing solid waste management concerns. I'm excited for the new leadership at TCRMM and the upcoming discussions for material management. I also want to express our sincere thanks to the county's peak committee um, for their support in closing um, Seneca Meadows landfill by 2025. We eagerly await the legislature's decision on the resolution scheduled for July 17. 18. 18, sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Anne. Um, today, we have a special guest from Steubens County, Michael Bolino, the town supervisor of Thurston, Tim Hargrave, who just made a rousing speech, thank you, and Susan, I, I, I apologize. <laughs> Dr. Witz. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, your presence is greatly appreciated. Michael and um, Tim and Susan are deeply concerned about the information reviewed in the solid waste management plan, which was just altered at the beginning of this meeting, which is a good news. Um, however, I want to inquire where the error in number was, uh, came from. And uh, the repeated, we, I have also have a concern about the repeated mention throughout the document about, quote, small amount of sludge still being applied somewhere in the region. How small is small? Quoting from the original uh, draft plan, on page, from page 32, uh, it says, the majority of the biosolids generated in the county are landfill, uh, 1,300 tons of biosolids from the county, who were delivered to the Chemang County landfill in 2021. Additionally, approximate 1,471 tons of biosolids from the village of Cayuga Heights are land applied to this Nixon farm. How small is small? 1,471 tons. 1,500 tons, an average car, the weight of the average car is 1.5 tons. 1,000 of them. Is this a small number? How small is small? We want to know the number. I read the care plan carefully, and I share Michael's yeah, concerns. Thank you. Actually, I, during my three minutes, I thought I heard in, in the beginning of the presentation that the that that is no longer land applied. There was a correction you guys gave. That okay. I just wanted to make sure I heard correctly because I wasn't sure. Um, just a few things that I wanted to share. Um, that uh, there's a couple. Um, one piece of legislation that I'm working on that I, I did want to share with you all. Um, that is a PFAS disclosure act that would require that any um, point source. Um, release into water, surface water or groundwater, um, that would have to be measured and reported and it would have to be publicly accessible, uh, as well as um, any of the landfills that send leachate to wastewater treatment facilities that would also have to be reported um, and publicly available. So um, hugely important because we can't really do any intervention if we don't really know where it's coming from. Um, I am very well aware of, of all the issues with PFAS, as we all are. Um, the state is rapidly uh, getting up to speed. There are some of us who are keenly aware of it. Um, I really appreciated that there were people here that brought up biosolids, um, data on biosolids. Banning biosolids and the spreading of biosolids specifically is something I'm very interested in. Um, I have already looked at the, uh, the legislation for Massachusetts. If any of you have scientific uh, data that you have collected that you wanted to present here, please, by all means, send it to my office, Kellis A at NY Assembly, 
because, as you know, I'm a nerd and a scientist and I like data. Um, so uh, any data I can collect, you will be doing me a favor um, in building a strategy to try and convince my colleagues that that is a good idea. Um, particularly interested in data from farmers and stories from farmers and input from farmers, that would be exceptionally helpful. Um, and the other issue, of course, is that it's being sold for compost in some areas, so it would be uh, a two-part, both in the spreading and the selling uh, of that as compost. Um, so I just wanted to share that that is some of the stuff going on. I appreciated what you guys talked about, but I did, um, I know of all of the, the allies that I've ever worked with in the, our, our facility, um, materials management facility has always been always on the front end of what I'm seeing in any other community. So I really do appreciate and that you're opening it up for all of us to give honest public comment to, by the way, thank you so much. So thank you guys all for showing up. Next we have Paul. For yes. This is not a donation. This is a bag of um, things that I've been trying to figure out what to do with for the last <laughs> two years because they won't fit into recycling and what I've done is made up a list of all of them which I'll give to you in all the comments that I'm going to provide later. Um, Richard started off with a comment that things are a little bit not strategically tight. Um, I'm concerned about how there wasn't boldness in writing the plan and it may be the structure having to respond to the state. And it may be the five or six conditions that you have to answer. Um, but there were 26 words written by um, the chief of staff to Dwight Eisenhower to start World War II. And that's all he had. And it basically said, you are commanded to use all land forces to subvert and win from the German right. That was about it. And from that, everything got driven. Now, in terms of sustainability, nowadays, um, the 10-year plan seems like it's not quite honoring the limits of the environmental catastrophe that we're in. Three years ago, it was said that we had three years to make major changes. But that was three years ago, and we haven't really done that. And now people are saying we should have done that. Problem. Um, on, on the positive side, this is an amazing document in terms of its detail, but I want to go up not 40,000 feet, but about a mile and look down. Um, I would change the word rethink to, to reimagine and give people more space to give alternative and complementary strategies. I'm sorry. Is this better? Yes. Yeah. And I would add a, another one, and I'm not sure if it's a word respond or redo, but somehow we have to undo what's been done. And this gets me to the concept, not terribly well defined, of the circular strategy. Um, it's more like a slinky coming downstairs. We've got things coming in our stream of life and things going out, and there's bottlenecks all the way along the way. But Unless decisions say with, oh my gosh, um, Arby's having Pet 6 recycling, that's going to be garbage no matter what. And I guess my last point is that I only found one typo in the entire document. <laughs> and that was on section 3.5.7, line 2, and it's window O instead of window. <laughs> but I'll, give, I'll send my comments to you on all the different topics um, that I have, and it'll be independent along with an editorial that will be published in Tompkins Week the next week that will give some ideas. Thank you all. Next is Rebecca. And after Rebecca, we have Joey. So uh, first, my first comment is thank you so much and yay. Great to see that work. I agree it was really well done and um, really proud to be part of this camp. Secondly, I you know, teach three classes on circular economy at Cornell. 
and want to say that I'm looking for opportunities for students to engage, and so I'm happy about that. And third, I guess Joey's going to touch on this more, but I think we have some common cause to make on sustainable events. And I think I'm really, as I will go on to comment, say about you know, this PFAS issue like everybody else, but I want to say single-use plastic deserve more attention and you know, reviling and at radical action. So <laughs> sustainable events, I think that's at least a public way to start. Nice. So on to nice. PFAS, though, nice. I see Back to the mic. Sorry. Oh, Mike. Um, so, uh, on to the PFAS topic that's obviously captivating everyone's imagination based on how many times it comes across my computer screen every day at least. So I'm on a, a panel for the National Academy of Science on um, the relationship between soil health and human health. And so I, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of stuff about PFAS. And um, I do want to say that I think just saying don't plant apply biosolids is, is sort of an inadequate reaction. So I wanted to say a couple of things. First off, that we should source separate our own waste like we should everything else. So human excreta, you know, we should sort of separate it not as human excreta, but as pee and poo are two separate things and they should have separate fate. So pee cycling is my current um, object of, of interest and so I want to put that forward as part of the sustainable events. Um, but we can uh, uh, apparently do something about PFAS at the uh, wastewater treatment plant through pyrolysis. So high temperature treatment of biosolids in the absence of oxygen will break that carbon fluorine bond that is the characteristic feature of current polyfluorinated alcohol substances. So, so apparently if we just turn our biosolids into biochar, not only do you break the PFAS up and get rid of it, but you also prepare a product which is actually a really good sop that can soak up and immobilize what is otherwise a very mobile contaminant. So if we could put this biosolids biochar at landfill sites, it can prevent the PFAS from you know, hemorrhaging into our environment. So I want to urge a really thoughtful strategy, and frankly, a bunch of us here in the room were already like hysterically attempting to make bio, our biosolids into biochar before the PFAS issue ever blew up, at least I, before I ever heard that acronym. I was really keen to do that because we can improve soil health. So if our response to the PFAS thing is saying, no more carbon going into our agricultural soils, no offense, but that's pathetic. You know, and really we can do better. Uh, and so I would just, you know, I guess I'm speaking as a citizen, someone as a criminal person, um, take responsibility for our, um, our stuff, our, our excreta, um, get rid of single use plastics, and thank you so much to our county people for um, being very forward looking and awesome about this. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Jelly. I'm just, I stand on my toes. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Joey Gates, and um, I run a dish truck, and we provide durable dishes for folks to use in events instead of disposables. Um, we've been in operation since 2015, and started as a not-for-profit, but as was pointed out by Barb Ekstrom's comments, uh, it moved too fast for the not-for-profit structure, so I'm now I'm an escort, which allows me to still share the business with people who are carrying on after I'm gone. Um, and um, so uh, we've kept about 250,000, over a quarter of a million dishes out of the landfill single-use dishes. Um, we've also captured about 100 gallons, probably more, in the, of compost. Um, so, uh, and uh, in doing so, um, what I've seen in um, thinking about circular economy, which is what propelled me to do this, um, was that we are transforming the idea of a product providing what we need. Plates are products if you buy them as disposables. The service they provide is conveying the food to you. So if we start to think about what we use in our daily lives and as a society as services and how can we provide these services, which will involve workforce development, as you talked about. Um, I'm an admin assistant at Cornell. I work with Rebecca. Um, and I am allowed by my group to set up durable dishes for the events that I coordinate um, and wash them afterwards. It's two hours more to my day, but you know I work for a sustainability center and so that's allowed. Um, and also uh, custodians. And so we need to think about the labor force and how do we transition garbage haulers into dishwashers, basically. <laughs> um, and uh, when we release um, pressure on one part of the ecosystem, um, we put pressure on other parts of the ecosystem, and what I see that most is water. 
Uh, we live in a water-rich area, but the pressure becomes how are we heating the water? Right now, I am washing dishes with fossil fuel heated water. And the gray water, which is hot, goes out into the um, municipal water system. This is, these are resources. We have nutrients in the gray water. We have heat in the gray water that could be run through a heat exchanger to preheat more water. So if we start thinking about circular economy of waste as a larger concept, solid waste I know is your focus, but as a circular economist, I want to see us thinking about all forms of waste, whether it's light pollution, heat pollution, gray water, nutrients in the gray water. And so that would be um, my suggestion, and I will write that in my comments. I meant to start with thank you. Um, I moved here in the 90s and was thrilled to join a conversation about sustainability, and I'm thrilled to still be here. Is there anyone else who would like to speak who didn't sign up? Okay? Yes, I do. Okay. My name is Jose Lozano. I used to be the director of the Ithaca Wastewater Treatment Plant Laboratory. Now I'm currently a consultant, retired here in Arapaho. There is a terrible concern that we have about the misleading information about a presentation I gave probably two years ago. Uh, it's about what happens to the Ithaca Waste Treatment Plant biosolids. We've been completely opposed to land application of biosolids, believe me. And there was a mention on uh, the clean uh, release, press release, that the Ithaca Waste Plant applies it to a Corland plant, to a Corland site. That was a test, that was a pilot, try to see where the contaminants went. And it's over. It lasted less than one season. And all the biosolids are going currently, unfortunately, I agree with Rebecca completely, are still landfill. And we are very ashamed of it. It's a black eye in our record. The solution is biochar. It's an energy positive alternative. Instead of landfilling, we'll get green energy out of pyrolysis. Why? Why are not we doing it? It's absurd. Anyway, that was my point. Currently, the biosolids of the Ithaca waste plant are not being planned for. And there are no plans to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Please state your name. Yeah. Pete McDonald of West Danby, um, treasurer of Sustainable Finger Lakes. So I want to speak to the document itself. Uh, throughout the document, TCRMM talks about a contract that the county has gotten uh, with a out-of-county uh, facility to take our trash or our stuff, uh, waste stuff. Um, and nowhere is that mentioned except in one starred um, page where it is indicated that it's a, a Casella um, facility in Ontario County. Can anybody confirm that? Okay, so if it is Casella, as is indicated in that document, they are a corporate scofflaw. They have been fined $500,000 by our own state, DEC. They're under multiple litigations uh, across the Northeast. So I urge that TC, RMM, and the county really look at what actually happens to our stuff when it goes out of county. Because if, as is under litigation, uh, Casella is putting it in the trash and 
town dump there, then why are we spending time as citizens to wash and supposedly recycle this stuff, and why is the county spending a dime on it? So there needs to be in the document clarity, not only on who this uh, um, waste contractor is out of county, and whether it is indeed uh, Casella, and whether indeed Casella is actually recycling what it says, because we're wasting all this time on something that doesn't get recycled, goes into the trash stream, and therefore, if we can educate people that even buying plastic goes into the dump, no matter what you think it's going to get recycled, and if we can help the county to save money from wasting its time to sort this stuff, uh, that should be certainly something that this document should spend time to educate everybody. So thank you all for being here. It's really wonderful to see citizen participation in something this important. I will put my comments uh, into an email, um, but I think it's critical that we don't fool ourselves <laughs> and feel virtuous in our recycling if it's just going to the dump. All right, thank you. I was born and raised in Ithaca, and my family owns a woodworking company in the area. Um, I went to Fall Creek Elementary School, Boynton Middle School, Ithaca High School, and I'm currently a SUNY student in New Paltz, New York. Um, I study sustainability and visual art at school, and um, I think the thing that I feel most excited about right now is education and outreach initiatives, um, because I think our young people are really the, like when we're talking about reimagining, right, and recreating our systems of waste management, um, if we can teach a generation of young people how to do it in a way that is inspiring and exciting, um, that's how we're going to sustain any efforts that are made in this 10-year plan, right? So it's really about, like, this is a big ball, and I feel really excited and grateful to be here. And, um, and I just am super excited about engaging young people on the issue and, like, talking about PFAS. It's like we learn about it in school. I just learned about it in college, you know? That was, like, my first entrance into it. And, like, young people are so capable of having these conversations, and especially because there's a lot of adults and families in the area who don't have access to this kind of education. And when our young people go to school in public institutions and are exposed to this kind of information, they might go on a field trip to the wastewater treatment plant, and they're like, Mom, guess what I learned today at school? It's like, this is how our waste is managed. And it's like children very quickly step into that role of not only being educated, but educating their families. and. Um, this plan is one that relies on the transformation of household practices. Um, so, I think, oh, and yeah, so just valuing education and the role that education is going to play in building the, you know, putting the wind in the sails, you know. Um, I think that's everything I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm John Dennis, and I'm actually just coming up with more of a Robert's Rules of Order, which may or may not be in place today, but I think in view of the fact that Mr. Scalino and others have come over an hour and a half to begin to tell us about some very urgent issues, they should be granted more than three minutes. So I'd like to sort of make a motion to the group here to see whether other people, since we've got more than half an hour of spare time, I'd like to open things back up to such uh, speakers if we may. Uh, could we see a show of hands, whether that might be a good idea? So I think, I think it carries, I'd like to suggest that it carries with, with all due respect. Oh, what do you think? I don't see why not. Um, I'd like to finish up by um, 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock, but we, originally it was 7.15, but uh, we'll all, well, whatever you say, let's take that 15 minutes or more. Mr. Scalino, do you have, would you like to come up? Or? Um, and, and perhaps take questions as well. 
because I realized I just got in line, so you can go after me. No, no, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Sorry about that. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. It's working. Thank you. My name's Amanda Kirchgesner. Right, let me just please just interject just for a moment. So we'll take some more speakers. Um, we're not going to be opening up a question answer uh, forum. So we'll just keep it to comments, please. Go ahead. Thank you. My name's Amanda Kirchgesner. I live at 4471 Jacksonville Road in the town of Ulysses. I am a lifelong resident of Tompkins County. I want to say there's some brilliant minds in this room who work around sustainability, so I'm all about encouraging people to just slow down because one of the things I've encountered in my efforts organizing locally, regionally, state, now nationally, is that blind progressivism rushes us into solutions that aren't really that. So I strongly recommend you talk to the people who are working with the wastewater facility, I know that there's huge opportunity to do greater methane harvesting of biosolids. I can't say, I just learned about this issue today. That's why I rushed in the door, it was 6.35. Uh, but I think it's incredibly important. There are, there's a joint committee that meets monthly with the town supervisor of Dryden. Ithaca has representation to talk to the wastewater facility about their capacity and what they can actually manage locally. So I think we really should spend a little more time uh, getting our hands dirty, if you will. I mean, I've walked by the outflow station there before. The guy working was happy to give me a tour as just a curious person. And the people who work in our public service sector in this city, in this county, are profoundly desirous of serving people who live here and pay taxes here. Um, I am not a fan of people from outside of Tompkins County telling us what the solutions are. I'm all about them helping advise us on their structures and how they do things, but just because it works somewhere else doesn't mean it works here. This is not there, this is here. And I would just like to remind everybody to check in with your breathing. It's what makes us alive here now in the present. Um, but it's great to see so many faces that I recognize here. And I'm quite certain that if we work together, we can absolutely generate a solution that is net zero, or maybe even net positive. Like it'd be awesome to produce more electricity locally near the farmer's market, where they're planning to put a boatload of housing. So thank you, and see the rest of my time. Uh, have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else that you know might have got cut short on time? We have anyone some time. Else? So, if Diane, if you wanted to say more, if anyone. We have someone who didn't speak here, or um, I couldn't finish my speech. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But if you were, could you scan the so, um Hello. I am back. I want to continue. I have a um, speech. I only finished half. So I'm going to go quickly. Thank you for your patience. I read the draft plan carefully, and I share uh, folks' uh, concerns of uh, people from the students' company. Um, according to uh, an article from a magazine, Biocycle, from 2015, approximately 4,500 tons of sewage sludge were produced annually from Ithaca area wastewater treatment plant. 4,500 tons. But the new draft plan states that the total sewage sludge landfill in our entire county in 2021 was only 1,356 tons. What happened? to the remaining 3,144 tons. It's, did it just disappear? What happened? Did uh, uh, people poop less? What? <laughs> um, the number in the 
documents simply do not add up. The use of the word unknown, also pointed out by Michael, about the tonnage, year, and disposal method indicates a lack of communication and transparency from the regional monopoly, Casella, uh, with a history of violations and lawsuits. This lack of information impacts people's health and livelihood. In May, the land application of sewage sludge caused harm, leading to the state banning it last year. Many people are unaware of where our sludge goes. It's time for, to work toward full disclosure. Our grassroots organization, Zero Waste Ithaca, is running a plastic-free July campaign with trifecta policy appeal to the county legislature. One of the policy focuses on sewage sludge. We urge the county legislature to, one, call on New York State Legislature to ban down the application of sewage sludge and end the export of it. Two, pass skip the stuff legislation. Skip the stu stuff legislation requires restaurants to provide utensils, napkins, condiments, etc. All the things you don't need or want upon, only upon customer's request. Ban three, ban up artificial turf installation or reinstallation in the country. County, I'm sorry. Thank you. If you agree, I, we encourage everyone to send comments to your county representatives in support of these policies. We are also hosting a film screening of Story of Plastic at Cherry Street Theater on Monday, July 14th at 7 p.m. Thank you. Please join us Thank you. Um, so we are um, running a um, zero waste project at Hospitality at Grassroots this year. Um, 800 people per meal for four days, three meals per days. If anybody would like to volunteer, you could use two more people. You get to mingle with the stars, um, <laughs> and wash a lot of dishes, and keep a lot of garbage out of the landfill. Too. Can you hear me? Is this working? Um, good to see you, Brad. I didn't recognize you out of context. But, um, all right, so Figure Lakes Reuse is demonstrating that the public wants to see a better path for the materials as we've watched donation volumes increase each year. And as fast as we learn how to get it on the shelves, the public again demonstrates that the demand first. The, that the demand nor the supply has not yet been satisfied. But we can't do it alone. We're experiencing even as we continue to grow, that a larger scale effort must be planned in partnership with the government, private industry, and educational institutions. The work that Crowd is doing, which is circular, uh, Circularity, Reuse, and Zero Waste Development, which is a, um, a, a bunch of people from Cornell, Historic Ithaca, Finger Lakes Reuse, um, the, and the Christofferson Center, um, is doing a bunch of research to highlight that a, a major portion of our waste, construction and demolition materials, is well researched and exciting. But we still need to build a system to get those materials to new, ideally local markets. The more local, the better. And we have components for the system already with significant elements at Historic Ithaca and our reuse centers and a re robust series of online marketplaces. Um, together, let's filter, sort, and wring all the value out of the waste before it's burned or buried, as those will continue to be the options, with incineration being increasingly promoted by the waste handling industry. We can significantly reduce the volume of waste by having an intentional network of enterprises, providing a robust ecosystem for business-driven, local reuse, upcycling, and creativity. Our waste is without question an enormous challenge, but one that, dis that demands constructive solutions. Tompkins County has an opportunity to remain a leader in the materials management field, and by thinking outside the box, by partnering with the waste industry, local colleges, economic development agencies, and planning departments, local enterprises and startups can act as a healthy and thriving waste diversion system while we wait for other legislative initiatives to pass. Thank you very much.
believe we're gonna we're gonna close the meeting. Um, just want to thank everybody for for coming out tonight uh, for the comments. Um, very very valuable to our department, and uh, we want to encourage everyone. Want to get this up? <laughs> um, encourage everyone to you know submit their written comments. Um, Cat will throw it back up on the screen. I think everybody knows it's, uh, it's an email address and. Submit uh, comments um, directly to me um, at the recycling material management office. Yeah. Once all those comments are submitted and integrated, will there be any direct feedback? Out of, here's what we here's what we learned and here's what we implemented or something like that. Yeah, you want to kind of run through how we're going to be responding. Sure. Um, so we'll be developing a responsiveness summary from all the comments that we've received through public comment. Uh, with that, if there's needed changes to the draft plan, we will incorporate those ch uh, changes. Do you want to reiterate this is a draft plan, so we are, you know, appreciate the feedback that we're getting, and we're looking forward to the comments coming in and writing. Um, and then once that's been done, it'll go to the DEC for review. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.